Hey up everyone, it's Rory here from Inline the Shadows. Today is episode 34 with another Rory, Rory O'Connor. It's quite a weird one, guys, because usually like Rory is a proper ra- random and rare name. So like um, it's going to be a bit tricky for me, like referring to myself. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really excited today to have Rory O'Connor. Um, he, he's a bit of a big gun in the area of suicide, guys. And I think he's got so much expertise and knowledge. Um, he's not puffed up. He, he just loves people. And from an early age, um, he got fascinated, not in a weird way, but fascinated with why why are people dying? Why are they taking their own life? And um, I was really uh, glad to read his book that he's just released, guys. So it's um, When Is His Darkest, as you can see. Um, so it's basically why people die by suicide and what we can do to prevent it. So, yeah, um, Rory, thank you for coming on today. It's really good. No, I'm to delighted. Have you. And as you say, it is a yeah. bit odd talking Rory to Rory, but yeah, Rory's are the best, clearly. And no, so I'm really looking forward to our conversation and talking about, yeah, such an important area um, male suicide and, and obviously supporting each other and supporting um, men in general. Yeah. It's such a detailed topic as well, because I, I remember I was coming back from work um, last week and he was on a three way conference um, uh, with a doctor. I think she's based in the Swansea. Is it Anna? And um, there was a and John, it, and John, I, yeah, yeah, the Austrian um, professor as well. And it, it really fascinated me, like seeing you guys as like depth of knowledge, but also how layered this subject is, whether it's in the research world or just like someone like myself with Enlightened, it's just like community support groups. Um, mm. How how COVID, I feel, has brought people together more um, and collaborate in such a way that I think we can really lower suicide and help people better. So yeah, I found that pretty, pretty interesting last week. Good yeah, event. no, because that was, I think what you're, you're talking about is we run the, what's known as the Early and Mid-Career Researchers Forum on suicide and self-harm. And actually it's, as the name suggests, it's focused on people early on in their career trying to understand and work in the field of suicide prevention. But I think you're right to think that hopefully one of the benefits of COVID, of, of which I don't think there are that many, but one of the benefits has been this maybe breaking down barriers or and that because we've we've all been put into this new world of working differently, interacting differently, it's given rise to a whole range of opportunities that 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 all of us can more easily with the benefit of Zoom now and other obviously platforms, we can hopefully reach more people. And I think in the work that I've been doing over the last 25 years on suicide research and prevention, I've all, have always been really, really keen on ensuring that the research that we do, <clears throat> excuse me, the research that we do gets beyond the ivory towers of academia and having these conversations. And, and, and basically because I can research suicide and research suicide and research suicide, but unless it gets out, that the, the evidence or understanding gets the people at the front line, and that could be clinicians, that community, could be community organizations. I mean, groups like yours and work that you're doing, I mean, it's so vital that we all have this conversation because we're all experts on our own mental health. And, mm-hmm. and I've, my expertise is twofold, I would argue, to, in the academic stuff, I've certainly got that expertise, but I've also got my own lived experience of being directly affected by suicide and also my own mental health. So and I think the breaking down these barriers is so, so important. And you're right, I think COVID has helped us do that better. Yeah, definitely. I was, I was thinking about like a different evidence as well as suicide. So I remember I was reading from your book, um, like different things about people killing themselves and, and the numbers involved. I was just really fascinated. I'm, I'm, I'm like literally with a pencil in your book, just underlining mm-hmm. so much stuff. But, um, something that really struck me is, is numbers and I, I really try to emphasize in our group that um at the end of the day you just become a stat and uh, people really matter they're all individual people and something that re- astounded me Rory was the the backed up research paper that said it was about was it 135 people um will know of someone will be impacted by one person that's took their own life and I was just like really hit by that hard because I've had a family member that took, took their own life last year and um yeah it's just really it's just crazy to think that how many people that has a ripple effect on and so can you just share with our viewers like what that may may look like and how we can 
of those amount of people, there's like over a hundred people here who could help um, see things sooner. Yeah, no, well, so just to unpack that a bit, Rory, um, so I think you're right, is that there's research published two or three years ago from the United States showing that for every death by suicide, every tragedy, the, the likelihood is that maybe 135 people may have known that person in some capacity. So that's 135 people potentially bereaved or affected. Now, of course, much more distant acquaintances may not be directly impacted, but the bit none of us can ever anticipate or second guess is the impact of a suicide on others. Because even if somebody is quite distant from that person in terms of being a, maybe a more distant acquaintance, you don't know what that, that the experience of that death may have impacted on them in terms of opening up or reminding them of some experiences they've had themselves. And so that's why it's so important when we're thinking about supporting people who are bereaved by suicide. Of course, we, we look to those who are close and family and friends and colleagues, but we should never dismiss those in the wider circle. And I think that's I mean, certainly in the work over the, over the years, a number of people I've met who maybe some the, the, the stories they tell about their own bereavement are a friend, but maybe a friend of a friend rather than this immediate close friend. And they've been really, really badly affected. So just then sticking then on the sort of statistics for a second, it's so important, as you've said already, that we look beyond statistics. But I think because every behind every one of those numbers is a personal tragedy. And um, so we reckon there's about 800,000 people lose or struggle to live um, each year across the globe. And, and suicide, depending on which statistic you look at, it's a leading cause of death in men under 50 in the UK. Yeah. It's a second leading cause of death of our young people. And so you really get a sense of the scale of the tragedy that is suicide. And, and I suppose what all of us are trying to do, and certainly what I've been trying to do with my team here at Glasgow, is to understand those complex set of factors that lead to suicide so that we can better identify who's most at risk, who's vulnerable. Now, before I talk a bit about trying to understand that risk and the complexity, yeah. the stark reality is that we just, we cannot predict with any certainty who will die by suicide. So even though we have made marked advances in the last 25, 30 years in understanding the factors associated with suicide, we're still no better than the flipping of a coin a toss of a coin at determine predicting in advance who will die by suicide. Yeah. And there's <clears throat> lots of reasons why we're so it's so difficult to predict suicide. Part of that is that although every suicide is a tragedy, in statistical terms, it's a it's what's known as a well, it's a rare event. Because for in the UK, for example, for every hundred thousand people in a population, about 10 people will die by suicide. Yeah. So in a way, when you're trying to predict suicide, then you're trying to predict the 10 people out of the 100,000, say, in an, an area, are more likely to die by suicide. So it really is the, the needle in the haystack idea. Yeah. But not only are you trying to identify the 10 people and hopefully and then intervene and protect them, but it's not even identifying the 10 people. It's identifying what one of the sort of founding people in suicide prevention is like an American called Edwin Schneidman. And he often talked about what he described as death day. So what he was talking about there is not only are you identifying who's at risk, when they're at risk, when they're more likely to end yeah. their life. And that sort of gives you a scale of the challenge. Now, having said that, though, and I'll let you get back in, sorry. Is, <laughs> it, um, is it, although there's, um, it's really difficult to predict suicide, we should never stop trying to prevent it. And we should never stop trying to reach out and connect with others. Because one of the things I talk about in the book is the power of human connection. So no matter what's going on in somebody's life, and we know that it's never just a single factor that leads to suicide. Uh, and even though there could be so much complex trauma from somebody's past or stuff going on in their life in the here and now, sometimes what just gets through, these small things can make such a difference. And these small things like this, that, that sense of human connection, because often we find that people who are suicidal Think that they're a burden on others yeah. you think that the world would be a better off place if they were dead and and so so they, they can't really difficult to appreciate 
not acute suicidal crisis that like how they see beyond the blinkers of the tunnel vision of suicide that they yeah. cannot see a time when suicidal pain will end and that's why anything which helps basically provide a, a chink of light in those moments of crisis a sense that make, maybe you do matter and I talk about people I've met over the years in the book who I talk about one one guy who was intent on ending his life and he left his flat and was just taking a walk to clear his head and to decide what he was going to do to in his final moments and it just so happens that he that one of his uh, an acquaintance he'd never spoken to just had said hello to but they shared the same commute to work and they yeah. sort of every few, park, every day or two, it? yeah it was through the park wasn't it yeah it was, it was through the park there. yeah, yeah. And, and but the, the, the lady, she just could see there was something. So initially when she saw him, she was smiling. And then he then saw her smile change their frown as if she'd recognise, my God, he, there's, he doesn't look himself, even though she didn't know him. And she just asked him, was she, how is he doing? Is he doing okay? And he said that moment, it was just enough for him to just, for well, that brief second, second when he was acutely suicidal, to sort of give him a chance to reflect. And that I'm not saying that's, how you prevent suicide, but what it illustrates in that case was he then actually went and did something about it, and then went and spoke to his GP. But that, but it, his re reflecting on all the complexity in his life, there was something as simple as that, um, yeah, which yeah. seemed to make a difference for for him. And indeed, Samaritans, obviously the organisation which has saved so many lives in the UK, a few years ago, Samaritans had a campaign which was small talk can save lives. And it's the same principle. So, so although the factors associated with suicide are complex and it's really, really frightening when we think about suicide, yeah. I would urge anybody, please, if you're concerned about a loved one, please reach out. Please, that sense of human connection and common humanity could be the start yeah. of conversation which could save somebody's life. Exactly. I'm, I'm loving how we're going into this because it's, it's like going through different parts of your book, which we highly recommend and we put it on the screen for people and the link for them to to buy it today but um something so powerful about that human connection and you mentioned something in your book about how um is there a certain type of um people who 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 take their own life do they fit a certain profile and um are they any different from like us and i think that's so true like with, with, with when we look at strangers or even people with loved ones like i was on the train um the other day on the way into London, um, I was quite like, anxious trying to um, give people space to like that not intentionally sit next to them if there was an opportunity to sit somewhere else. And I, I saw this lady and I, I caught eye with her and just smiled at her. She smiled back and I just said, oh, may I sit next to you, please? And she was like, yeah, yeah. And anyway, we got chatting, just the, that human connection. Lo and behold, she she told me, like because of the work I'm doing, oh, I've just got out of um, being sectioned for 10 years. And I'm off to the theatre today. I, I'm honestly, Rory. I tell you, credit to her, massive, and and the support she was get given. But it goes back to that whole when you try and categorise people with mental health, the stigma related to it. Because if I looked at her, never would have guessed in a million years she had been sectioned for the last ten years. And it's so easy in life to kind of like put people into groups. And I think John Peterson talks about grouping, how dangerous at times it can be. But like, I, I know of with this you kind of exempt yourself i think you use those words yourself you, we try to exempt ourselves from ever being suicidal like oh yeah like if you said to me five ten years ago or oh, rory you'll, you'll be like extremely suicidal um through throughout 2020 i'd be like no nah, not a chance mate yeah. never so yeah it's just yeah no because i mean it's such an important point and i i talk about it being this idea of othering in the book and it's mm. and it's a way in which we we can sort of feel protected we think that mental health problems or things that happen to other people or suicidality is something which happens to other people. And I suppose the message is that mental health is on a continuum. And, and many of us are gr so grateful that we're on the part of that, the continuum, which is about well-being and nourishment and satisfaction and life and fulfillment. But then as you move from the other end from that, so that, moment, that part of well-being to the distress and pain that people often do who do struggle um, experience and it's and, and I've struggled with and you've struggled as well and that's what it's exactly it's remembering that there's no single there's no face of somebody who's suicidal there's no face or particular type of 
person specifically who will is more likely to become suicidal. Now, of course, there are risk factors. We know that people who experience, for example, early life trauma or increased risk of mental health problems. We know that that obviously that basically some types of mental health problems uh, run in families. Now, that's not saying that mental health problems are inevitable. These are all about vulnerabilities. We know that people from more socially disadvantaged backgrounds are statistically more likely to die by suicide or have suicidal thoughts. But the point is, I suppose, that there's this complex interplay and this perfect storm of factors that can come together in any one of us. And although we know that three quarters of all suicides in, in the UK are by men, of course, women also yeah. die by suicide. Yeah. One of the challenges we've seen in the, in the last few years has been there's been this increase in suicides amongst young people, young women. And that's, and I think that in part, well, we don't know for certain why that increase has happened, but part of it might be the fact that a lot of the suicide prevention efforts have been focused on men, rightly, because they represent three yeah. quarters of all deaths. But perhaps we've taken their eye off the ball and understanding the risk in, in women as well, and young women. So when I think about the complexity and the factors that lead to suicide, of course, it can affect any one of us. But the way I try and characterize it in the book is I draw on the model of suicide that I've developed what's known as the integrated motivational volitional model, which, of course, is a bit of a mouthful. So we just go for the IMV model of suicide. And although it is looks quite complicated, I've tried to break it down and into hopefully fairly straightforward parts, because what I've tried to do with the book, which I also have here, there you go. <laughs> um, is um, is trying to write, write the aim behind writing the book was a book for people who don't read academic papers, for people a book which will be accessible for anybody with an interest in understanding suicide, and that yeah. includes people who've been suicidal themselves, or people who are supporting those who've been suicidal, or or working and working with people who are suicidal, as well as sadly those of us who've been bereaved by suicide. And but in terms of the, in what I try to do with the book then is. The IMV model, at the heart of the IMV model, is this idea that suicide is not driven by a wish to die. It's driven by this desire to end mental pain. That individuals who are suicidal feel trapped by that mental pain. Yeah. But that mental pain, where we then think about the complexity is, lots of stuff then contribute to that sense of mental pain. And part of, and I talk in the model, in the model that this, this sense of entrapment is often driven by feelings of defeat or humiliation or shame or loss or, or rejection. They're sort of the key sort of psychological factors. And then the question I asked in the book is, well, let's think about what may increase the likelihood that somebody feels defeated, increase the likelihood that somebody may feel a failure. And, and then when we try to answer that question, that's when we look to somebody's past. We look to trauma. We know and I, there's a lot of, there's a, a, a big section on trauma in the book in which I talk about how trauma can impact on, obviously, the, your biology. We know that trauma can affect the stress response system in the body, which I do work with my twin brother on stress, on the stress system. Because And we know that cortisol, the stress, one of the stress hormones, is maybe just what we describe as dysregulated. It does, isn't, you don't release as much of it if you've experienced trauma early in life. And that may be because your body has just been so overwhelmed by the pain and you yeah. basically run out of the body runs out of being able to produce cortisol. And then if you're not being able to produce the cortisol, cortisol is what you need in terms yeah. of fight or flight response to deal with the challenges in yeah. life. And that's just one of the ways in which trauma, for example, part of the puzzle to understand suicide risk. But we also know that anything which interferes with your attachment relationships early in life, I mean, really important because how we learn to interact and relate with others as adults it's how we relate it with others as kids when we and maybe our primary caregiver that's how we started to learn these relationships and so that so when we look at that complexity we think well actually that that sense of early life trauma can in, influence you in the here and now today through many different pathways and then also if you think about individuals if you if you've been from a more socially disadvantaged background well you're much more likely to feel hopeless or you're you're more likely, we know, to have experienced much more knocks in life. And so then it's, it's all this building together. These, all these things come together in a perfect storm of factors, which may 
and some people manifest itself as depression or anxiety or that sense of the mental pain associated with mental health problems in general but then just over time you just get exhausted and that that bit of people who are su acutely suicidal often talk about just being overwhelmed or just wanting just basically being exhausted and you just can't take yeah. it off and i'll say one little thing and then i'll let you come back <laughs> again is that but this idea then about um I, so if you think about physical pain, there's only so much physical pain we can resist, yeah. right? Because we just, we, it just becomes too much, too overwhelming. It's exactly the same with mental pain. As we, there's a limit to how much mental pain that we can experience and tolerate. And when that becomes overwhelming, well, then that's, that then contributes to this sense of entrapment. And it's this sense of entrapment, which is suicidal act, or the suicidal thoughts are what well, that's what you're saying go well actually the only way i can end my pain is by ending my life mm. and the bit that we all need to think about i suppose <clears throat> as society as individuals as communities is we all can do something no matter how small to contribute to somebody else feeling worthwhile somebody else feeling yeah. less defeated more connected and less trapped and if we can do that uh, we can then reduce the sense of entrapment. Now, but when I say at all levels of society, I'm talking about governments and, and communities more broadly. So governments in particular, you think about the number of people who present to clinical services with mental health problems who don't feel as if they've been treated compassionately or treated yeah. like a human being. And that sense of lack of compassion, that just that lack of compassion then contributes to their sense of feeling worthless, Absolutely contributes right. to their sense of being trapped. And of course, and that just escalates the risk. Anyway, so that's my sort of, and uh, one of my sort of rants at the minute of really, we yeah. all can do something. And now that's not about, because when you lose somebody to suicide, you blame yourself and that pain and guilt is so awful. So, yeah. I mean, it's, not, so it's not about, say, I'm not saying that because we can never be held responsible for the actions of an ind another individual. But yeah, what we can not. do is think about what we can learn from all of our own experiences so we can prevent loss and pain in others. Yeah, you, Rory, you'd, you'd be absolutely appalled at the true testimonies of men we're supporting of how they have been trapped as human beings, accessing health services from the NHS, mental health support. Honestly, I, I, won't, I won't say what, how it is because I'm grateful for the NHS and there are some amazing people who work mm -hmm. hard and who, who, who absolutely are embedded with with empathy and compassion and that's at the forefront of their heart and why they do the job that they do but some of some of the people who have dealt with some of the blokes that i've supported in line with with our boys and we're just like oh my gosh like where is your empathy like these people are on the edge and you're literally invalidating their pain for a start and then you're delaying them to get the help and then you're denying them it and it's just like wow um yeah, yeah but just just on that point though Rory. So, so as you've just said, I, I'm, I'm, for the most part, the frontline mental health professionals I've met have been re remarkable people and have been compassionate and empathetic. But of course, there are exceptions. But my, my beef is with the system and the yeah. system, the system doesn't work. And that's, and so basically that there aren't the services or supports available or accessible for men or whoever your focus on men particularly. Yeah. And so then I think there's this, you're caught in this vicious cycle of, People working on the front line aren't able to deliver the services for the men in this case. And then you've got you are, that cycle then is, and well, of course, then the people group um, delivering services get frustrated. The men, are, our needs aren't being met or not being supported. And then you've got this cycle then, which things just, just get worse and worse because there's not the fit. So I think we really need to properly, especially for, men, for services for men, we need to think again because it's about... I, th I think the mental health services just aren't fit for purpose. And indeed, we don't know. We don't know whether the psychological treatments and therapies, which have been shown more generally to be effective in reducing suicidal behavior, we don't actually know yet whether they work for men specifically. So I think we need to think really carefully. In the acute end of things, people can get access to, hopefully can get access to, to care. They're acutely suicidal. But it's the bits before that we should be doing much more preventative work, much more engagement work. That's right. And then obviously groups like yours and lots of voluntary work going up and down the country are yeah. filling this gap, which is not currently filled um, adequately by 
sort of statutory services. And I think we need to do more about that. And the key thing is write to your MP, write to your member of the Scottish Parliament or the Welsh Assembly or the Northern Ireland government and make sure that mental health is prioritized and the mental health is treated with the same respect and the same funding and resources as physical health. We need proper parity of esteem. Yeah. Well, you'd be pleased. We've already done that, Roy. Uh, January this year, we got seven out of the 11 Nottinghamshire MPs on a, on a virtual call like, like this almost and um, giving them a more of an awareness chat, trying to build a relationship with them. We can move forward because um, we, we want to holistically work with the MPs, as you say. Um, we've just uh, last few weeks got in touch with Head of Public Health England in Nottinghamshire. So we're just trying to bridge that gap as you say and we, you know it's not about us it's, it's about the bigger picture and doing our little bit so we can just really use their expertise and uh, and they can get anything from us that they need um that's massive on our heart and light and you know we're in nottingham and nottingham's our city and that's where we start and we'll continue to help but it's really hard though rory like you know there'll be men watching this and hearing all of the, these pearls of wisdom um but i'm just thinking about something that you put in your book you know when you was talking about those eight volition factors mm -hmm. that i absolutely love we put it on the screen already for people watching this about how they transition from thinking about wanting to take their life to actually starting the behaviors um sleep you said i, I remember um you had a really cool uh, diagram which we'll put through about how if sleep um is really not going well for for a bloke um that could then just really, it's like a, a point of no return. And me personally, like sleep, sleep is my, my thing. Like if my body's stressed um, or I, I'm emotionally tired or worn out or I've faced a trauma, like literally my body will shut down to sleep. But then this year, interestingly, my sleep got impacted. So I'm um, currently taking a CBD oil. Um, so this stuff, this juice is the one. So it's helping a lot and highly recommend it. But um, can you just unpack that a little bit then for our viewers about for a bloke, like how sleep can really help or it, you know? Yeah, help. no, so there's two, there are two things that you mentioned. One is the volitional factors. And I'll come back to that in a second, because that's just what it's described. The factors which are about crossing the precipice from thinking about suicide to acting on your thoughts. But then going back a step is exactly such an importance of sleep. And so sleep, obviously, in biological terms is a, fundamental homeostatic function is a technical term I remember from my A-level biology all those years ago. But, but it's become so and so more, more and more evidence of how it's important to our mental health is we disrupt our sleep. Sleep we need to, the body to repair. We need sleep to ensure that we're, we can problem solve, we can regulate our emotions, that we can basically navigate our challenges of everyday life. And so we've done work and others have done work which shows that <clears throat> there's a strong association between disrupted sleep and insomnia and problems getting to sleep and staying asleep. And it's associated with all forms of self-harm and suicidal thoughts. And, and the world always seems much, much more dangerous and much worse if you don't have, if we're not sleeping, right? Because it's that, it is like the building block, the fundamental building block for our well-being <clears throat> and um. And I'm hoping you can still see me, Rory, because... Yeah, I can. You keep going. It's come on my screen. <laughs> yeah, we've got some up on the screen instead. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, so yeah, so sleep is so, so vitally important. And um, and I think that that would be one of the first things I would try and target in, in terms of psychological treatments or psychological support, trying to get your sleep regulated. And that's I know that's more um, easier said than done. <clears throat> So yeah, and, and I talk about that in the book and in terms of this cycle, because then things do then yeah. can escalate when, you, when you're not being able to sleep. Now, the second thing you mentioned was this going from thoughts to acts. And the reason that's so important is because what I've touched on so far is in this idea that mental pain has driven this sense of entrapped, you're trapped by mental pain. And that's what we argue is a key driver to somebody becoming suicidal in the first place. So somebody thinks of suicide, and as I've said already, see suicide as the, the ultimate solution to ending their pain. Now then, we know that, thankfully, most people who have thoughts of suicide don't make the transition from thinking to attempting suicide or dying by suicide. And the best evidence out there, it's, we think it's about a third, though, so still substantial, 
A third of people make that transition from thinking to acting on their thoughts. They think most people will, will not die, but say there's still a third will make that transition. And so what I talk about in the book, again, drawing on my IMV model is, so I say there's eight factors that we have identified in our research, which are important in understanding that transition. Now, the first one is having access to the means of suicide. So of course, if you've formulated, if you've been suicidal and you've thought about how you'll end your life, and then you've got access to those means, it stands to reason you're much more likely to act on your thoughts. And so, so I suppose if you're watching this, if you're somebody who's caring for somebody who's suicidal or you've, you're suicidal yourself, if somebody is has a plan and has access, please respond immediately because that's quite an alarm. That's quite alarming because they you know the means and the motivation. So please, please reach out for help immediately if that's the case, and try to keep the, your environment safe. Um, so you do not act on your thoughts, or your loved one doesn't act on your thoughts. And that's why I also talk a lot in the book about there's a whole chapter on <clears throat> on safety planning trying to identify what the sort of warning signs that a crisis might be escalating. And then if there's a warning, if those warning signs are, are escalating, I talk about in, in the safety plan of um, identifying internal and external coping responses to, again, yeah. distract you in the moment of crisis. Because we know that suicidal thoughts come and go in these waves yeah. of intensity. And then when that wave of intensity is really high, when the person is feeling acutely suicidal, we're trying to make sure that they're as safe as possible in that moment of crisis. But then there are other factors uh, which are part of these volitional phase, this volitional phase. Things like the more impulsive you are, more likely you are to act in your thoughts. Um, and I think that's probably particularly an issue for young men <clears throat> where we think impulsivity levels are much higher. And then other things like um, knowing somebody else who's died by suicide. So the technical description is exposure to suicide and that's where we started this this um discussion yeah. really which is obviously this idea of the 135 people potentially and so again if somebody's having thoughts of suicide and somebody else they know has died by suicide or attempted suicide it's much more likely that suicide or suicide behavior is what we describe as being cognitively accessible something you may consider doing yourself so again that's a warning sign um so if somebody is having thoughts of suicide, what you're trying to do then is trying to identify which of these volitional phase factors are present, because that could give you an indication that somebody is more vulnerable, more at risk. So definitely always try and check and see if somebody is, has, has been exposed to suicide and a close family member or friend. And then we also talk about what's known as the capability for suicide. And that's work drawn from a colleague in the United States, Thomas Joyner, and this idea that for you to um, attempt suicide, you have to overcome the life instinct and of fearlessness about dying and yeah. or being fearful about dying. And so this capability, this idea of capability for suicide is thought to be two things together. It's this fearfulness or fearlessness. And the people who attempt suicide have overcome the sort of life instinct and they've overcome that fear of dying. And also they often have higher levels of physical pain tolerance, which is often required to enact a suicide attempt. And though, so again, the presence of those two factors increase the likelihood that somebody may act on their thoughts of suicide. And then the last two I'll mention just for the purposes of, of this conversation is people who are having mental images of actually imagining <clears throat> themselves dying or dead, or we think are more likely to act on their thoughts. So again, if you're concerned about somebody and they've got a sort of mental imagery of dying or death, and again, I would try and intervene early because that's another warning sign. Yeah. And then the last one I'll say in terms of the volitional phase is, is the single best predictor of whether somebody will attempt suicide in the future is whether they've tried in the past. And that's any form of self-injured behavior in the past as a statistical marker of future risk. Now, it's really important to, um, to provide a caveat though. So although past behavior, the same as any other behavior, is the strongest predictor of future behavior, yeah. in the case of suicidal behavior, the overwhelming majority of people who have maybe self-harmed or attempted suicide in the past will never self-harm or attempt suicide in the future. 
Um, so, so it's important to get that in, in context, but it still is a statistical risk factor. So again, that's something I would check in with somebody if you're concerned. Yeah, so just to bring it back to you then, Rory, I mean, so those yes. relational factors are all outlined in the book and, and hopefully in a way which is, helps people understand this transition from thinking to acting on their thoughts. Definitely, and, and throughout this chat, as you've been going on it, um, we've, we're putting up these um, images from your book um, so, because I, I know a lot of people quite visually minded as well, and it so helps. Like everything you describe is beautiful, and it's exactly as it is on the tin with the pictures. So, yeah, definitely, it all like collaborated nicely. Um, but yeah, when my, my uh, pitch went off, don't worry, well, that's where we got them things popping off uh, for the YouTube uh, this Sunday. Um, so you mentioned, and it really, really just like jumped out at me right now on this chat. Um, and I want to park this, this for a few minutes because. The last episode we had was Paul Thomas, um, episode 33. Now, Paul and I talked about um, male fertility, miscarriages and things like that, which is such a taboo subject, especially with blokes. Um, you know, I, I predict that it will be probably one of our lower viewings on the whole channel, just because of the fact that men just block it out naturally. Um, they probably even deny that you know, the baby was a human, you know, all sorts of yeah. mechanisms to protect themselves. But one thing that Paul mentioned when we talked about suicidal ideation, which we both experienced strongly, he said that when you want to press that button and take your life, that, that is something else because you, you're basically, you, you're not, you're not scared. You, 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 you're going to do it. And he, and he said, well, maybe actually that I, I didn't, have the guts to do it and I, I've said it out loud as well trying to reassure family uh, very close family in the last year or two is that um, as horrible as it is for me to confess and say this and I don't like to say it because I don't want to scare my wife is you know oh don't worry I'm, I've not got the minerals to do it like you know it, I don't think I could I, I've got the balls to do it you know so but it's that thought you, you just said the fearlessness of actually taking life and I think many men like that's what I guess is the dividing line in the stake in the ground. Like you get men who are just like, no, I'm not bothered. And then some men like myself and Paul were like, no, I don't as much as I feel like I want to, I don't think I can actually do it. I think that's a really good talking point, especially for blokes watching and can relate. Yeah, to uh, no, it is a to it's such an, an important topic. Um, but I suppose in my experience, I've sadly known people who've said what you have said yeah. And I, I, I don't think I could go through with it. And then they did. Really? And that's because oh. for them, over time, the pain became too much. Um, so the pain of living Outweighed. basically overcame that other pain, the pain of, mm. of dying. Um, so, so although I, I, I think it is reassuring what you're saying with you are, and that's great. I'm really pleased to hear that. Yeah. I suppose I, my, the reason for sort of giving the counterpoint, the counterpoint is, we should never be complacent. And that's why it's so important that we continually work on our mental health and go and, and talk about it because I, I mean, those other taboo topics or whatever of using male fertility or yeah. miscarriages, as, and, I mean, they're such difficult emotional issues. And, and, and I think they're things that we, we as men need to be talking about. Um, yeah. and, and I think anything which sort of strikes at the core of who we are, um, like giving life, your ability to give life, um, and if something if that's something that you really want, of course that's that's part of your <clears throat> core who you are. That's of course going to be really potentially detrimental to your mental health and well being. So yeah, so the so the thing then go bringing it back to the fearlessness is. So again, I would be just checking in with people. So um, and again, one of the things I do in the book is like the those volitional factors. There's eight questions below each of those factors yeah. just for helping people make sense of what that means for them or their life or their loved ones. And one of them is asking somebody, because we know that this fearlessness, the same way that suicidal thoughts come in these waves, that fearlessness also comes in waves and we, we it changes over time. So again, it's just maybe checking in with yourself and with others because the whole point about, um, the, the, I'm just coming back to it, coming into my head there, some of the work at the start of the book on the myths around suicide. And one of the myths of, of, is that oh, people, if people really want to take their own lives, they won't be telling you about it. They won't be talking about it. And that's just not true. 
is that people, we think about 40% of the people who die by suicide have, a, have certainly told family members or loved ones before they die. And that's, not, and that's because one of the characteristics of the mind of somebody suicidal is this sense of ambivalence. And that ambivalence is between living and dying are often, also often between, I mean, self-hate and whether for themselves, obviously self-hate, and also there's often maybe some other interpersonal dimension going on because there's usually some sort of interpersonal crisis, which is right. usually associated with most suicides. So it's that, so the, the emotions are really, really complex. So I suppose my, my take home is that yeah, it's great that people are saying, I don't, I don't think I'd be able to enact a suicidal attempt. Yeah. But don't, just, don't use that as your only armor. The, what we should be doing is having, providing ourselves, building our own armor up so that we are, are protecting ourselves. And I don't mean armor so that you don't then talk about your emotions. I mean the opposite. I mean, do whatever we can to provide ourselves with support, skills, responses, and people around us. I mean, as John Donne, the philosopher says many, many years ago, no man is an island. And the point of that is that oh, yeah. we're, we're built, we're social beings, we need others around us. And that sense of social disconnection, that social isolation, that loneliness is often associated with suicide risk. So anything we can do, that's why it comes back to something I said at the very beginning of that providing that sense of human connection and yeah. how that human connection can be provided. We'll be talking, could be talking about those difficult topics with somebody along, being alongside other men. But the other one, which is there's work which is going on up and down the country with at football clubs, at cricket clubs, at rugby clubs, of trying to get men alongside men. Not necessarily, to, let's explicitly talk about our emotions, but actually being alongside other men, and, and it could be in a, in a, a situation that has been a football club, which are just alongside other men. And, you're, and then these conversations then evolve and happen, these supports happen when you're doing other activities. So thinking about different ways in which you can support men. And I think your Facebook group is a great example of a, yeah. one, a safe space, but that's a safe space which will work for some men and not for others. Absolutely, so it's just yeah. looking at all these different ways of reaching out. So, so that traditional model of, oh, having to go to therapy or, I mean, that's, that, that, that model works for some, but not for mm -hmm. others, especially for men. Absolutely. And that's why we need to look at all these different ways, modes of support and interaction. And again, doubling back to something we started off this conversation with about COVID and one of the pluses of COVID, because COVID has given us this opportunity to connect digitally, to break down boundaries and think of new ways of engagement and support. And that's where I hope we can move forward. When COVID is, a, is but a distant memory, I'm hoping we'll, we'll have done these, these other good things, sense of community connection, social cohesion, new ways of working and supporting each other. I hope they, they stay with us and we harness those moving forward. Absolutely right. Yeah, and that, that's what we, we're looking to do is, um, is meditating and strategically finding um, light-hearted, non-threatening, typical mm -hmm. bloke um, do. So uh, like, it just becomes part of our fabric like you know that whole that i love i love that quote that no man's an island we're gonna, we're gonna have to trademark that and use that for th that philosopher because um yeah that th that is what we're about is brothering one another like we want to put on events like um pint and a pie night where we just chill and chat like i'm just thinking england against germany tonight like i'm just thinking obviously it's sunday for the viewers onwards but this recording's on the the, the eve of uh england will have won by then that's that's right come on that's, that's right so yeah we, i just think about all the men that are just like out and just probably getting absolutely battered and you know like how many men are intentionally asking the question you know are you all right uh, as as um yourselves and roman kemp i know roman kemp's documentary we've um unpacked that at enlightened and, and loved it and that's actually how i found you of all places and got your book and been been watching you closely now in a, in, a, in a healthy way and yeah, I just um, appreciate you coming on and, and unpacking the pills with us. But um, before we close, Rory, I'd like to answer our Enlighten the Shadows question, which is, you know, for right on topic today, you know, we're, we're exploring suicide awareness specifically for men. Um, you know, I think they'd probably get a lot of stuff they'd have to re-watch on this. But if you could give like one short piece of advice for a, a bloke who just feels like they, you know, they're not scared of dying as we've unpacked and they want to take their own life. What, what could you advise them in this moment? 
Well, my my sort of short answer is, or short piece of advice is, please hold on. And the reason um, I say please hold on is because even when you're in that darkest of places and you think that the pain or the worthlessness or the, the extent to which you feel a burden on others, you think that will never change and that will never end. It does. Yeah. And that I have lost count of the number of men who I've met many years later who in that moment that when they were in really, really difficult places, they thought life would never be fulfilling again, that life would never be worthwhile. And they're so grateful that they were able to see a way through that crisis. So my short message is please hold on because things do get better. And even though you cannot see, see that, may not be able to see that in this moment, please trust me because I have 25 years of meeting people um, who've been in so many such dark, dark places and have so many occasions where that darkness has lifted. It may not lift tomorrow, but it will lift someday soon. So please reach out. Please, if, you, if you've reached out for support and it hasn't worked, try something else. Because like anything in life, we, need not, we don't always get the solution or the answer immediately. And that's why it's, it's time to then just have that courage, the courage to hold on. And because there will be somebody out there who will miss you, you are valued, please, please hold on. Amazing, Rory. And, you know, and this coming not just from the 25 years of experience, like academically, like you, you talked beautifully about your own your own journey, like especially losing your close friend Claire and, you know, um, seeking therapy only just like, what was it, five years ago? And, you know, no man's perfect and we're all on our journey. And I, lo I, love, um, I love that advice. And, you know, I hope it blesses uh, at least just one bloke watching this today. But yeah, um, guys, this has been amazing. This has been episode 34 of Rory O'Connor. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, get on it, guys. We want to reach as many men across, um, not as you say, no man's an island, but across the waters. And um, we are supporting men internationally as well. But um, YouTube's got over a billion people on there. Just think how many men that could could bless. And you know, if it just saves one bloke's life, this episode, it's so worth our time. Um, we're on social media. Uh, we've put Rory's stuff throughout the episode, but we're at Enlighten the SH1. And uh, we'll see you next week. We've got Dr. Robin Hadley, I believe. Um, an amazing guy we found on Twitter again. Um, sh shared beautifully on Father's Day about, you know, he has delayed um, aspirations of wanting to be a father. And yeah, we're just going to unpack that, guys. But watch out, watch this space. We've got great guests coming up. Um, and we hope you're blessed by this. Have a great day, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>